gave different theories in international trade? So sometimes we get this kind of question that we are given with theory and you have to tell who actually gave this theory in terms of uh, MCQ or match the following. So for that kind of question, this recording might be of some use to you. So absolute advantage theory. So what is an absolute advantage theory? One, this was given by Adam Smith. So supposedly you and I are there and uh, you are very good in making uh, commodity X and I'm very good in making commodity Y. You can produce more amount of X in a given amount of time than what I can make of X. And I can make more amount of uh, Y than you in a given time. So I have an absolute advantage in Y and you have an absolute advantage in X. So this is what the absolute advantage theory is. And here there is, <clears throat> there is a situation in which the trade is going to help us because I can concentrate only on making uh, uh, the good in which I have absolute advantage. You can concentrate on making the good in which you have absolute advantage and we can trade with each other. We can produce more than what we were producing earlier. So there are gains from trade, right? Then comparative advantage theory comes. It says this, that there can be a situation in which I have absolute advantage in both the commodities and you have absolute, absolute disadvantage in both the commodities, but there still is a room because uh, there, there still is a room for trade because I can focus on the commodity in which I have a lesser opportunity cost. And you can focus on the commodity in which you have uh, you in which you have lesser opportunity cost. So by that, we will be trading. Although I have absolute advantage in, in both of them, but still there is a room for trade. So this theory was given by uh, David Ricardo. And then there's a theory by Haberler theory of opportunity cost. This is built up on, uh, on uh, Ricardo's theory, theory only. And uh, he has focused on uh, the gains from trade, from comparative advantage, welfare gains, and so on. hector ohlin theorem. So hector ohlin theorem says what? It says this that uh, supposedly I am one country which has a lot of labor. You are the another country which uh, in, in your country, there is a lot of capital. So you will be producing more of the good which is going to use capital more intensively. I will be producing more of that good which will be producing labor more intensively and then we will trade. This is what hector ohlin theorem is. Factor price equalization theorem. So what does factor price equalization theorem tells you? Factor price equalization theorem tells you that uh, supposedly there are two countries. Let's say uh, country A and country B. Country A can produce more amount of some good, let's say X, at uh, in, in the lesser time. Country B is using its own labor, so it is producing lesser amount of goods. Naturally, in country A, people can produce uh, more goods in less time. Na? So they are productive. When they are productive, they will be getting higher wages. In country B, people are producing less amount in the same time. So they are less productive. They will be getting lesser wages. Now, entrepreneurs in country A might think it is better to use labor from country B because it is asking for less wages. So it will be demanding workers from country B or it will be shifting some of its production to country B. I'm just giving an example. So what will happen is that demand for labor in country B is going to increase. The moment demand for labor in country B is going to increase, the wages are going to increase. What about country A? In country A, because entrepreneurs have shifted their production in country B, the demand for labor has fallen. So wages have started reducing. So earlier, wages were higher in country A, lower in country B. Now what has happened is that wages have started falling in country A and they have started increasing in country B. So that is what the factor price equalization theorem is, right? New trade theory, economies of scale theory. So this was given by Krugman. See, un, uh, um, your traditional uh, trade theories, they focused on resource endowments. They focused on... Uh, a comparative advantage. But new trade theories, uh, they also bring in the concept of economies of scale. So the idea is that uh, uh, when, the, when, the, when the firms can produce more, what they experience is that, that there is a fall in their average cost of production. 
when there is a fall in the average cost of production, then with because of the lower cost, they can ask for the lower price. More customers will come, and they can probably dominate the uh, entire market, global market also at some time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, so this explains the reason why the trade can also happen because of economies of scale. Why can there be? Uh, why can there be certain industries concentrated in certain kind of areas only? Right. So that is what new trade theory is given by Krugman. Product life cycle theory uh, given by Vernon. Now, in the product life cycle theory, the idea was supposedly I create some product. Hmm. That's a new product. And uh, because I have created a new product, uh, there is a lot of demand for this. People wanted it and they, they bought it. Now what happens is uh, this is the growth phase. Now other competitors come into the market. They copy the same product. The product is still in demand, but it has the sales have leveled off. So there is a maturity phase. And then there is a decline phase. Why? Because people know the new and the better products have come into the market. So there is a decline phase. Uh, for a particular product. Some other countries have started producing a better product. Now, how is this related to international trade? For example, there is one country who has produced a certain kind of a product. And this was a very good product. There was a demand for this product. So that country was producing it mainly. But then other countries have started copying this product. When other countries have started copying this product, the product enters a maturity phase. Sales have leveled off. But then the sales started decline in the uh, in the in the main country in the innovative country. So the product pattern has shifted from the main innovative country to the competitors' country. So there is a shift in the product pattern also, product distribution, product pattern. So this is what the uh, your product life cycle model is. Preference similarity hypothesis. Now, what is preference similarity hypothesis? Supposedly, you and I are friends and uh, we like a certain product. So, we like a certain product if we like uh, to go to a certain kind of movies. Similar kind of movies. So, you and I will spend more time together. Uh, how it is helpful in international trade? Supposedly, your, in your country as well as in my country, the kind of the demand pattern which people have, they have the similar demand pattern. They are, they are demanding same kind of goods. So don't you think you and I will trade, trade more with each other? In the similar way as when you and I were friends and we were going to watch similar kind of movies together. So that is what your uh, preference similarity hypothesis is in very, very simple terms. And this is what... Uh, this was given by Linder, Ribzinski theorem. So Ribzinski theorem tells you what? Supposedly, I uh, in 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 my country there are uh, different kinds of resources which are available. There are labor, there are capital, and uh, what happens is that there is an increase in labor. Now, when there is an increase in labor, then I will be producing more of that good, which is producing more, which is using more labor, right? So if there is an increase in the endowment of the factor uh, in, in my country, I'll be producing more of that good, right? So for example, there is a factory and in that factory, uh, two kinds of goods are being produced. And in one kind of good, there is a certain kind of labor is being used. In another kind of good, there is labor B type is being used. Now, there is an increase in the endowment of labor A, type of labor A. So you will naturally be producing more of the good which is using labor A kind of labor, right? And less of that good which is using labor B kind of labor. So this is in nutshell is Ribzinski theorem. is. So if your endowment of the factor is increasing, you'll be producing more of that good which is using this factor more intensively. Metzler paradox. So what is Metzler paradox telling you? Metzler paradox is telling you this, that supposedly uh, I am one country, you are another country. I have, uh, I'm giving a very simple example. Supposedly I have a certain kind of a diamond with me. It's a very, very valuable diamond. And you have another kinds of diamond. 
and uh, so you are saying okay give me this one diamond i will give you 100 diamonds in return which you have i say fine in place of one i am getting 100 so i'll take those diamonds from you no but what i realize is that even though i have more diamonds now but their value is less the what i have given to you is is such a specialized thing that uh, uh, its value is more but what i am getting in return is is of less value the point of this example is that sometimes what can happen is that even with trade it does not guarantee that there is always going to be a benefit so there is a medzler paradox. There is a paradox that even if I'm specializing in uh, the kind of the product in which I have a comparative advantage, I can still lose. I can still lose because the I can still become worse off because I can experience a decrease in terms of trade. This is what medzler paradox is telling me, right? In a very simple terms, I have tried to explain this to you. Immiserizing growth. This concept was given by Jagdish Bhagwati. He said this, okay, imagine a situation that uh, we are living in a country in which we are specializing in one kind of a product, let's say textiles. And uh, government has also taken up uh, this policy that we are going to boost the textile sector and there'll be more textiles uh, will be there in the market. Okay, fair enough. So, the government policy is there and there are more textiles are being produced and they are being exported. Everyone is happy because our exports are increasing. We are producing more. But what happens is that there can there is a possibility that we can flood the entire global market with our textiles so much that the prices of textiles will actually go down. And when the prices will go down, my incomes will go down. Although my exports are more, Although I'm producing more, but I'm getting no welfare. My welfare has decreased. My income has decreased. So there will be job losses. The idea is that with economic growth, there can also be the situation that my welfare, instead of increasing, might start falling. In a very simple terms, this is what immiserizing growth is. Secular deterioration hypothesis. Now, secular deterioration hypothesis is what it says this. So imagine my country is producing a certain kind of product. It has, it had a lot of demand initially. And we were exporting this product. We were getting a lot of value from the market, from the other countries also. But now other countries have started competing with us. And they have started producing uh, the similar kind of product which we were producing. So the prices of the product will fall over time. And if the prices of the product which I was exporting, they are going to fall, then... Uh, my country is going to lose in very simple terms. This is what secular deterioration. In, in technical terms, it means supposedly I'm a developing country. I was a primary product exporter. So what happens is that over time, uh, the country's terms of trade will decline as, uh, as, the, as the value of the primary products, they are going to fall relative to the manufactured goods. And I'm going to experience the fall in the welfare in very simple terms. This was given by Prabish and Singer, right? So these were not technical definitions. I've just tried to give you some idea so that some idea remains in your head. Uh, so these are not technical definitions uh, of any of these theorems. And mainly I wanted to make this uh, recording just to tell you who made, I mean, who were the persons who were behind these theories, who gave these different theories. So I hope it was of some use to you. Thank you, Vitaan.